and, and feel about you. I, I hope we don't need it, but if this is Apollo 13 tonight, I think you're going to be able to bring us home uh, safely. Appreciate the introduction. Thank you. Uh, welcome, everyone, to uh, Unplug. This is a, a fun series, and uh, I'm really looking forward to tonight. You're going to be in for a treat in terms of hearing Mike's story and the story of SpotX, which is a pretty remarkable uh, one in the front range here in Colorado. Uh, a couple things. One is, you know, it's like we're all on a boat right now and we can see landfall in terms of where we are on the pandemic and especially when it comes to Silicon Flatirons and hopefully getting some events in person sooner rather than later. Uh, I, like many of you, am looking forward to that. We're not that far away, uh, which makes me um, really excited about where we're going for, for next year. Uh, here is where we're going for tonight. Um, for those of you who have not been part of an unplugged session, uh, this is uh, entrepreneurial storytelling. And like I said at the outset, Mike's got a heck of a story to tell. Um, we're going to start with a few announcements. Um, and please feel free to lob into the Q&A or the chat if you've got some community-oriented announcements. Maybe your company is looking to hire. Maybe you're, you've got an event upcoming that you want to draw some attention to put it in the Q&A and Nate, maybe you can keep an eye on that. We can call them out as we see it. Uh, then I'll launch into a short introduction and then we're gonna do a Q&A with Mike, which will be the, the primary grist of this. We'll go for 40, 45 minutes and about 6.25 or so, 6.30. Uh, we'll turn to your questions. Uh, please put them into the Q&A as Nate said along the way. And we've got a few students on board that will be helping uh, moderate the, the questions from the audience. And then we'll have a, a wrap up at 6.45. Um, in the way of announcements, so I want to start with uh, our acknowledgement that Silicon Flatirons in CU Boulder today sits on the lands of the First Nations people. The traditional peoples of the land in Boulder are the Cheyenne, Arapaho, and the Ute Nations. And we uh, want to pay respects to the elders who lead uh, these communities. Um, additionally, in the way of announcements, for those of you who um, have been a part of this, you know our Startup Summer Program is a powerhouse. Uh, Silicon Flatirons has what I would describe as an internship enhancement program. If your company has interns, Startup Summer gets interns from different companies together on Tuesday nights, beginning June 15th and running through the summer. Um, it allows those interns to meet some of the best and brightest leaders. Uh, in the front range. And then behind the scenes, those interns hatch their own startup ideas. And at the end of the summer, we've got a pitch night where the interns uh, get a chance to pitch back to the community. Um, it's been a fabulous program. We're actually starting to see successful companies um, uh, now launched by former Startup Summer interns. Help had a really nice exit. Those two individuals, Fletcher and Kamran, met through Startup Summer. Super easy to recommend. And it is free, free to the companies, free to the interns. If you're interested, check out Startup Summer, Silicon Flatirons, uh, very easy to recommend. Also want to give a shout out to Richard Bass. Richard and I had a nice conversation, like Richard's on tonight. Um, Richard is uh, part, uh, actually the leader of Software Colorado, um, formerly known as the Boulder Software Club. Richard, thank you for helping us get the word out about this and look forward to collaborating with you going forward. I uh, also want to acknowledge that I get to do a lot of the talking tonight. Uh, hopefully, Mike will do more of it here shortly. But um, our team at Silicon Flatirons is great to work with. Uh, Amy, Nate, Catherine, Sarah are all on. Uh, Vanessa, many of you know, has been running events for years at Silicon Flatirons. She is moving on to Startup Colorado, where uh, we'll be working with her in a different capacity at Silicon Flatirons there. But I want to thank uh, Vanessa for all she's done over the years. And welcome our newest team member, Eileen Brown. So Eileen, uh, welcome and uh, look forward to working with you. And I know many people in the community look forward to uh, having you on board. So with that, let's get this going. Uh, short introduction, Mike Sheehan. Um, a, few, a few things. First, Mike was going to be a veterinarian. Went to, uh, to Vanderbilt to study, to prepare to be a vet. Had a change of, um, of plans. And among other things, explored for a while, worked in a cannery. We'll talk about uh, that up in Alaska. Uh, found his way back to Colorado, where Mark Pincus, uh, founder of Zynga, among other companies, uh, met with Mike in the mid-90s and said, you're an idiot. You're missing out on this revolution of the internet. You got to get involved in this thing. 
Uh, Mike said, well, that's an interesting idea. Maybe I'll just do that. Went to the East Coast and launched a company called Logix. Uh, he found out that entrepreneurship is easy. I went really well, went public. I had an interesting ride in the late 90s. And then I came to Boulder and the dot-com bomb hit. The economy collapsed. Uh, a company that he was working with, Aereo, uh, hit some hard times. He found entrepreneurship is hard. Uh, and from there, uh, he and some of the team members they'd worked with before launched a company called Booyah in 2001. Um, in 2005, Booyah went in two directions, one of which is what became SpotX. We're going to talk a lot about that tonight. Um, and Mike, uh, welcome to Entrepreneurs Unplugged. Really uh, looking forward to your story. Let's start today. And then we're going to go back to your days while preparing to be a veterinarian. But start today yeah. and, and just provide an overview. Where is SpotX as of May 19th, 5.39 p.m., 2001? Sure. Yeah. Hey, thanks. Great to be here. Um, thanks, Brad, uh, for the intro. Uh, you just kind of wrapped up my whole life and in, uh, in a very short period of time. So I think we covered it all. Uh, <laughs> so SpotX. Uh, yeah company we started uh, yeah, over 14 years ago, uh, founded it with um, business partner, Steve Sobota, CU grad, boom. Uh, and he's our CFO, uh, fantastic person. Uh, you know, it's a video monetization platform. Uh, so, you know, mostly what we do today is we work with, you know, what we call the supply side, but you know, media owners. So those are broadcasters like ESPN, uh, Discovery, uh, we work with device manufacturers like Roku, um, uh, you know, Samsung is a customer, uh, or new services like Sling or Pluto or Fubo. Uh, and uh, they use us to uh, essentially, you know, maximize the value of that video ad inventory of, you know, so what you're used to doing in terms of watching TV through your cable and satellite, and I know it's ads, but, you know, it pays for a lot of good programming. Uh, you know, when in the, in the satellite cable world, you, everybody gets pretty much the same ad, uh, apart from maybe a small percentage of the population. When you digitize that, when you do something that's uh, in what we call connected TV or CTV, which is most of our revenue, uh, everything can be addressable. And so what our platform does is it, it literally in real time auctions off the available inventory in that, in that pod. Uh, we call it a pod and that's a group of ads. And so think about like, when you're watching a football game and you know it's it's common to have a, a million households watching a football game digitally through their Samsung TV or Roku device or Apple TV via the app uh, when that when it goes to break and 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 there's a million households the Spotix platform will get a million simultaneous calls uh, in a fraction of a second we have to go find all the advertisers uh, to fill those uh, ads and it's you know uh, personalized for each and every household and then we package that up and deliver it to the household for those million households in a fraction of a second uh, so it's pretty cool I and mean, we, we do over a billion dollars a year in terms of transaction volume and um, you know I, I think that's why there's only a few companies in the world that can really do this do this well um, that, I think that's why Magnite uh, just uh, bought us and we closed the deal just uh, Oh, a couple of weeks ago, um, and they bought us for over a, a billion dollars, which I'm, I'm pretty proud of. Yeah, congratulations to you and the team. Thanks. And that billion dollar sale was on $13 million of investment coming into the company, uh, correct? In a Lamborghini. Yeah, yeah, yep. absolutely. We, um, we didn't raise that much. Uh, you know, we only did one institutional round. And uh, yeah, we only had to sell uh, one Lamborghini, which uh, obviously is a, a pretty fantastic story. <laughs> well, well, we'll circle back to that. Um, so just let me make sure I've got it right, because I think it's helpful for everyone to kind of get the gist of the business here, which is um, the moment comes where, say, Disney, or more specifically ESPN, has some digital and they're ready to serve an ad. And... Bernthal, the viewer who's logging into ESPN, um, is going to receive the ad. ESPN goes through SpotX, which decides Bernthal is going to be interested in tennis videos, and you deliver that tennis video advertisement to me, but you're doing it for, say, a million people instantaneously. Is that accurate? Yeah. 
Yeah, and that's very accurate. You know, it, it's we we work in the in the field of what's called programmatic. I don't you know expect everybody to understand what programmatic is, but it's it's basically the automated buying of this you know inventory, and so you know we match the you know that supply with the advertisers. Now, when they see you watching it, and they don't know it's you, uh, or maybe not all the advertisers know it's you, but they will target you based on maybe where you live, right? They can geo-target, maybe what time of day it is, what you're watching, or maybe they do have some information uh, around, you know, maybe what you've purchased before, et cetera. And, they t and so the advertisers will essentially bid to uh, get their ad in front of you. So we, we host that. And that's the, you know, that's what happens in a fraction of a second when you select the winner and we deliver that ad, uh, you know, to you. And um, will the Colorado presence of SpotX continue uh, under Magnite? Yeah, absolutely. You know, they, they bought us for the people. You know, it, it, it's a good, you know, compliment, uh, really. You know, what, what Magnite uh, does, and, and Magnite's really a combination of, of two other ad tech companies. One uh, was called Rubicon and the other um, uh, Teleria you know, a lot of their business was display and mobile, uh, you know, some video and some uh, connected TV, whereas most of our business is connected TV and, and some video. So it, it you know, they're, they're buying us for our, our technology, our expertise, our global presence. Uh, like I said, not many companies can do what we do, especially for that live inventory. Uh, one, one final name to, to get out, because I think we're going to come back to this, is you gave a shout out to Steve Soboda, who he'd worked with before. We'll come to that. Your CTO? Yeah, Alan Dove. I've been working yeah. with him uh, for 25 years. Uh, Alan is a yeah very special person. I mean, you know, you, you find a partner like that. And, and I, you know, he, funny story when we hired him in the mid 90s for, for, for logics. Um, but, you know, he, he just, he's the guy, you know, I'll come up with the idea and I'm like, can you do it? And he can do it. And he does it every time. I mean, just think about the system he, he developed today. It does 10 million transactions a second right now. So, you know, just the volume, the volume of data, the scale at which it operates and, you know, he and his team uh, built it. So yeah, yeah, special guy. Uh, we'll come back to some aspects of team recruiting and keeping it together as well sure. uh, over the years, which I'm really interested in, in how that's worked out for you guys. Uh, let's go back to your, your studies to be a veterinarian. Uh, you went to Vanderbilt in Nashville, uh, thought you'd be a vet. Um, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, I mean, you know, I think probably more than anything, you know, I entered college not knowing what the heck I wanted to do, right? And as I think most students are. So for the students uh, joining here, um, have faith. Uh, <laughs> so, and so, you know, it was something that I had picked and said, listen, you know, I've, I've kind of always thought about it. Let me pick literally the hardest thing I can pick, which is pre-med essentially, <laughs> and, and try to get through college when I, I'm not really even sure that's what I want to do. So anyway, you know, I got to the end. Um, and, you know, at the end of the day, I was like, I just, you know, I knew I couldn't just keep going to school. Uh, and, and so, yeah, I felt a, a fair amount of guilt. Uh, and I, you know, told my, I told my dad, I was just like, you know, I, I don't think I'm going to be a veterinarian. Uh, you know, I'm sorry. I feel like I wasted the money here. And, uh, and, you know, right away he goes, you know what, you don't need to be the veterinarian. You can just own the vet clinic. He's like, those guys make way more money. I was like, huh. And, and all, all my life, he's tried to he just push me, push me, push me to be an entrepreneur. Um, you know, sign, you know he, he would walk around when I was 14 around the neighborhood and go, hi, this is my son. He's going to do your lawn this summer. <laughs> so, you know, that's, that's where I got it from. <laughs> uh, any reflections about, you know, it's, it's a hard thing to know about when to just persevere and push through because everyone has doubts at certain times, right? You could imagine a world in which you had doubts about being a vet, but then decided to push on and, you know, it turned out to be a very fulfilling life um, versus when to say, you know what, this isn't for me. I need to pursue a different path. Any reflections about, about that generally, but specifically in your experience, how you made that decision? Yeah, I, you know, I mean, it's a good question. I don't know what really drives uh, me personally, right? Uh, I think you know, obviously a great upbringing and just, you know, a good work ethic. 
Uh, I think the understanding that um, if you work hard, uh, it'll, it will always work out. And I'm a big believer in like one thing leads to another, right? So, you know, if you think about like, you know, I, I left Vanderbilt. I, I drove cross country. You know, my friend was like, hey, let's go work up in Alaska. I'm like, sure. <laughs> Great. Uh, okay. So we drove cross country, got up to Alaska, worked in a cannery. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and this is weird. Like, how did it lead to anything related to today? But, you know, I worked my butt off. Uh, I worked more hours in that cannery than anyone else. I think there was a little bit of a drive there going, okay, I just wasted four years at Vanderbilt. I'm not going to be a vet. So, and I'm not like trying to be a professional, you know, uh, you know, offload or a fish off boats at five in the morning, but I work 18 hour days and I've walked away from Alaska with 30 grand and uh, in what my year? pocket. What, what year was this? This was 1994. Okay. Yep. Yeah. So, you know, that's, that's, um, that's, you know, in my pocket or in a bank account. And, um, and so just knowing like one thing leads to another, I drove cross country, I drove down the Rockies, I met my buddy in Vail just to stop over for a day. And he's like, hey, man, we have a room that just opened up. <laughs> you, you should stay. And I'm like, definitely. I'm going to go call my parents. I go to the payphone, right? Because there's this is I'm dating myself here. <laughs> uh, and I call my mom and she's like, oh, Michael. You know, she's just so angry at me. And then my dad gets on the phone and, um, and, and, uh, and he's like, listen, you can stay, uh, but, but give me all that money. And I'm like, no. And he's like, I'm telling you, you can stay, but you're going to give me all that money. Uh, I'll invest it. And so I gave him the money. I don't know how he did it, but I gave him all the money. I kept two grand for myself. I literally spent that in a week. So he was smart. Uh, and, um, you know, next round on me. And, um, and, you know, just fast forwarding when I wanted to start my own business, you know, and this is, you know, a few years later with Logics, I was like, oh, dad, I'm like, can I get that money back? And, uh, and he's like, yeah, he goes, I invested it in your, your brother-in-law's VC. And it's been a few years. And he's like, I'll, I'll write you a check for what it's worth. And it was a hundred grand. So I started my first company from that money from Alaska. So again, I just think like, it's a long way of answering, you know, this, this question here, but like, I just think, you know, hard work just does always pay off. And then just understanding one thing always leaves another. You never know who you're going to meet. You never know what's going to happen. Uh, and so, you know, again, a big believer of that. Uh, a couple of quick questions. Do you remember the type of car that you drove from Nashville to Alaska in 94. Oh, yes. Uh, no one knows what this car is. It's a Mercor Scorpio. <laughs> my There's got to be an it. auto file out there. <laughs> my, my, Did it make it? No. <laughs> <laughs> it ran out of transmission fluid. We were going to drive up to Anchorage. <laughs> and we actually ended up driving up through Canada. By the way, when we got to Seattle, we pulled out the map and we're like, okay. And I'm like, oh my God, Rich. I'm like, it's shorter to drive back to Richmond than it is to drive to Anchorage from here. <laughs> and he, so we're driving up and my car started conking out and we took a hard left, went to the coast, got uh, on the Prince Rupert ferry and then mm -hmm. uh, stopped in Ketchikan and pushed the car off uh, the ferry and then it turns out we were three weeks early for the fishing season so we literally had no money did a lot of dumpster diving too proud to call the parents it, it, that's a whole story that's another hour-long story here well <laughs> you know related to that though is um working in the cannery and some of those experiences that maybe were you know uh unconventional or you know really crafting your own path uh as a ceo you're trying to attract a lot of different types of people to work in your company. You're selling to a lot of different types of people. Do you have a sense at all that those experiences of meeting people from different backgrounds, of hearing different stories, gave you some pattern recognition or some ability to connect that you otherwise wouldn't have had had you, you know, continued living in, say, Nashville? Yeah, no, I think I can spot a crazy person from, uh, you know, pretty far away. No. 
Alaska was fantastic. It was a great experience. Um, like I said, I worked really hard, but it was the people from all walks of life. And I'm talking all over the globe. Uh, my, they brought me on. The first job I had uh, was to cut the belly of the fish. No, no, no. I'm sorry. Cut the lungs out, right? The belly had already been chopped up, uh, you know, sliced open. And I'm standing there. And uh, for anybody that's on this, they know I'm, I'm not a tall guy. I'm 5'8". I'm the tallest man on this line because I am with 200 Filipino ladies. Uh, <laughs> fast forward five minutes. I have sliced my thumb wide open. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm in the hospital. Um, you know, but they, they were just so sweet, so genuine. I come back over. Uh, I'm like, am I fired? Uh, and my line boss is like, no, but show up tonight. We got a new job for you. And I worked the night shift and it turned out it was like, you know, uh, a much younger crowd that was much less experienced. Uh, and so it, it was fun, but I just met so many different people who really did, did teach me about just hard work. Uh, and, and, and yeah, of course, getting exposed to, to that versus Vanderbilt, which obviously is, you know, a pretty privileged life, um, mm -hmm. to be able to get exposed to that and understand really the kind of the, the trials, tribulations, these people, very personal, what they have to go through. Um, yeah, it, it, it taught me a lot for sure. It's interesting. Uh, one of the recurrent themes of unplugged some sort of unexpected is there's definitely a strong thread of people who had sort of unconventional experiences like that, where they came across people from different backgrounds, learned something about hard work, you know, got out of their element. And I, I think it helps make some connections down the road. Dave DuPont over at Team Snap had a very international background. Uh, Nancy Phillips um, had a very international background. Very, very interesting to piece that together. Uh, let, let's um, go to that meeting with Mark Pincus. Um, you're in Colorado. It's yeah. the mid 90s. Someone says, hey, you should go meet this guy in Aspen. Um, did, did he say, you know, this internet thing is happening. You've just got to be part of it. And, and did you, did you say, oh yeah, or was there resistance on your part? Um, well, I mean, there was only resistance because literally the first line he said was what you said, you're a, you're a friggin' idiot. Uh, <laughs> and I'm like, uh, you know, so he worked at a VC firm. So this is before Zynga, before he had become, you know, really a thing, right? And, and, and he has done amazingly well. He's such a smart guy. He worked at my brother-in-law's VC firm. And, you know, I know what was happening. You know, my parents were like talking to my brother-in-law saying, get, please talk to him, get him, you know, make him get a real job. And so, and I was only going to stay out there, you know, one season. I knew that. Uh, but anyway, I, I went to Mark and um, yeah, he opened my eyes. I, I mean, I certainly knew the, you know, about the internet. Um, but that's about it. Like, you know, you're, I'm just snowboarding every day, growing my hair long and, uh, you know, fitting people in, 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 in snowboard boots. There are none of these for sure. And, um, and so to go out there and to talk to him and be like, listen, this, it, you're an idiot because there literally will be no other time in our lives when everything will be transformed as much as it will starting right now, right? I mean, yes, there was a Google, there was Microsoft Explorer, but you know, uh, there was Yahoo, it was still a directory. But you know, this is early, early days. They, most people, you know, e-commerce didn't exist. Most people didn't have a website or most companies didn't have a website. So these are such early days. So it totally opened my eyes. I did, I went right back, uh, back to Vail. I probably spent two or three weeks there. I bought a book, The Internet for Dummies. And I read that and I it was more about HTML and all that, but I was like, wow. And so, yes, I, I hightailed it back East. Uh, as you advise, I, I know that you sit on some boards now and I assume you probably mentor some, some college students and high school students. When you're talking to them now, do you have any similar advice, like look for a big macro like this to play into in terms of your career because it's a lot easier to be part of a growing market or you're like, no, that's not my advice. No, it's definitely my advice. I, I'm always saying, please pick a growing market, right? <laughs> Absolutely, exponentially growing. On top of that though, you know, uh, you know, enter a market that is ripe for disruption or that where there's, you know, not a incumbent, uh, someone who has it, you know, uh, uh, you know, a dominant foothold in that. And then if they do, you better be coming in with 
something that's so disruptive in terms of technology and just cost. It has to be so much, uh, you know, more efficient, uh, you know, and, and provide such less cost that it disrupts the whole thing, right? So, you know, who's the, a you know, back then AOL was the dominant internet provider. You know, a lot of people maybe don't remember it. They were providing dial up and then they just died, right? They, they, they had the world, but they wouldn't want to innovate against that dial up. And so I, I, I'd say, yeah, that's actually, you know, step number one for sure in terms of picking, you know, a space to go after. Um, I want to wind forward to uh, the birth of SpotX, but so I'm going to cross over quickly. You know, Logix is a, is a really successful venture. You guys grow it. I think you said you went from 25 people to a thousand. It went public, kind of an overwhelming experience. And you got a lot of real business experience during this success story in the late 90s. Um, yeah. You were a multimillionaire on paper <laughs> and yeah. you moved to Boulder, you buy a house here, um, you're CEO of Aereo and Steve Svoboda comes with you as the CFO of Aereo. Um, and you've got 6 million with the company, I believe at that point. And then the dot-com bomb hits in 2001. Yeah. Talk about the, the painful experience of this isn't going the way that we want it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it was, it was a uh, painful, uh, is not strong enough word. Um, you know, it was debilitating. It was demoralizing, you know, I, and, and I think, you know, listen, I'm 26, I'm 27. Uh, I, I think I'm the man, right? Little did I really connect that. Oh, little. Oh, no, actually, this was a bubble. And everyone was the man. <laughs> Every asset was appreciating. Uh, and so, you know, when Aereo went under, um, that was very hard. You know, you know, I had a lot of people. We had six million dollars, just lost that six million dollars. You know, this venture uh, backed, it was Ibele who backed us. It was part of the Fast Ideas uh, incubator. And, um, and so uh, it was hard, you know, personally, for sure. And just, you know, to my family, I mean, growing family. Um, yes, as you said, worth millions of dollars and just, you know, uh, got a little greedy and, and got a little overconfident and multimillionaire at 26. And then fast forward, uh, you know, I've, 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 all I have in terms, uh, in terms of assets is um, my house in Boulder. Um, and then that's it, <laughs> you know, no job. And so um, that was tough. And so I, I, I actually look back and I'm like, wow, I can't believe like, you know, Steve and I like just immediately were like, you know what, let's go start something. And this is a terrible, terrible time to start something. But you know what, you know, we've lived through kind of a lot of recessions, you know, over these past 20 years. Um, and actually, it turns out that that's actually a really great time to start something, right? You know, it turns out like not everybody else can raise money. And we definitely couldn't. We tried raising this money for this company called Booyah, which was, you know, we, Aereo was image search. Booyah, we're like, oh, that's cool. But like, it was just a cool technology looking for a business model. So lesson learned. You know what I really like is this pay-per-click advertising model that this company Overture started, which was an incubator uh, that, that started a company called goto.com. There were companies like Ink to Me, you know, Alta Vista, you know, Google's, you know, just all these, you know, early, early names. And we're like, I like this pay per click search space. Let's start an image based pay per click search company. And so we went out, and as Steve likes to say, we were going out raising money, and we might as well had syphilis. <laughs> like there was, no way anybody was giving us money. Zero. So I sold that Boulder house. Steve took uh, how many board. how many pitches do you think you did? Oh God. I mean, probably like 20 before we were just, just like, this ain't gonna go anywhere. Okay. Right. And even getting in the door, you know, so I guess qualify pitch. You know, yeah. did we get an audience? I mean, that the, the you know, if you're a VC back then, you know, I think the world was, you know, certainly imploding, particularly most VCs would have been focused on the internet. Yeah. Right. So everything was imploding back then. So getting an so, audience was even a challenge. So you go through this cycle of 
knows either I'm not talking to you or, or if you get in the door, there's like, sorry, Mike, we can't do this right now. And you mm-hmm. decided to self-fund. Yeah. So we self-funded, I mean, self-funded in that. Yes. Uh, I put money in, Steve put money in um, and what we had or what we could and scrape together. You sold your house in Boulder to do this. Yep. Yep. Move out. Um, can you just say a word if, if it's not too personal? Like what was that conversation like with your spouse? Yeah. You know what? She's amazing. Uh, she's every time. Okay. Let's do it. Like always. Uh, and so, yeah, you know, she's, she's just a, an amazing person. She's always backed me, which, uh, you know, you can, you know, for all those thinking about starting a company and, and you're, you have a family, just understand like, you know, probably in order for it to make it really work, you, the entrepreneur is going to have to work 150% to make it work. Um, and then your, you know, partner is going to have to work 150% to raise your family and to make up for your absence. Uh, so yeah, just not even moving out of a house, by the way, she was pregnant with our second child. Uh, and, um, you know, it was just never, never, never doubted. She's like, okay, let's go do it. We went out and moved to Longmont, bought a house for cash. So we didn't have mortgage. And that's a good thing. Cause I didn't get paid for a while. <laughs> and, uh, so you and Steve, uh, and was Alan, who was, who I know your CTO at Logix and, and worked on the technology that, that ultimately became SpotX. Was Alan on board at this point too? No, he was um, actually uh, working with uh, Pete Esler uh, and Fast Ideas and, and Ibelay. All right, well, let's, let's get the, uh, the Pete story out there. This is one of my, yeah. <laughs> this is a favorite. So you guys self-fund, you sell your house, honey, and your wife is in on this. You yeah. guys get some cash for bootstrapping and then you go to Pete and, and talk about talking to Pete for, for a little cash for Booyah. Yeah. So Pete is a wonderful man and, you know, uh, he is the consummate entrepreneur. I just lost $6 million of his money. Like that's, that's my street cred with him. <laughs> and I go to him and, you know, Steve and I go to him and we're like, Hey, okay, we're, I know this area thing didn't work out, but we're really excited about this pay-per-click, you know, model. And we want to take image search and apply it to, um, you know, to, to, to this, you know, this search area, you know, this image search. And, and he's like, God, you know, he's like, I love you guys. You guys are the best. He's like, but um, I have lost so much money over the last year. And so I don't, I don't know. He's like, I- I'll tell you what. I, I have a Lamborghini. I don't want it anymore. You can have it, whatever you sell it for, whatever the valuation is of the company, that's what I'm in for. And he literally is like, Sharon, and he causes, you know, yeah. And he's like, get me the Lambo title. T- signs it, gives it to us. That weekend I go pick it up with him. Uh, and then, you know, for the first three months of the, you know, history of the company, we're trying to sell a Lamborghini touring during the, the dot, you know, <laughs> bomb explosion so that was pretty challenging <laughs> how much did a lamborghini go for in 2002 eighty-five thousand dollars, <laughs> <laughs> and they cost 250 by the way brand new uh, and, and probably more than that to service <laughs> so one serious question and then one fun question the serious one is you ever ask pete like what gave you conviction that this was going to be a good idea worth um you know giving away the car on top of what he'd already invested. What, what, what did he see? Um, well, that's a good question. I think, you know, if, just speaking for Pete and, and, and knowing um, how he operates um, people, he just has a hundred percent. If he, it, he has a good read on people. Um, and, um, and it's really all about that. And I think he's really good at, 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 at reading people and then also getting people to believe in his vision and, and, and in encouraging those who are chasing, you know, their vision. So I, you know, it's like my, Hey, my father invested, my brother-in-law invested too during that round, Pete invested. I think it was it, like, I think they could have been like, what did he just say? Image, pay-per-click, whatever. Uh, my, they were in my, with you guys. My, yeah, I, you, you're the man. And, my, I, and I think my family invested because they're like, you got to feed your kids. <laughs> uh, and I'm guessing that the Lamborghini investment 
turned out okay for Pete. He made millions off that car. I'm That's so a proud fun of that. Story. <laughs> that is a fun story. All right, well, let's talk about the Booyah path and especially, it's an interesting one. You, you start this in 2001 and then in 2005, you guys forked the company, right? You decide there's really two companies here. Um, I'd love to hear, you know, I see companies that are trying to pick, are we this, are we that? We need to make a decision. Uh, I don't hear very, very many forks. Why'd you guys decide to fork it? And then um, was it clear that you were going to take what became the spot X side or was it like, ah, 50, 50, we'll flip a coin. Yeah. I mean, it's really interesting to say that because it actually goes back to your other point. Like, Hey, what, well, how do you decide what space to go into? And, you know, we were doing this search thing and we're like, okay, we're making some money. You know, we, we by the way, it was brutal. 9-11 happened. You know, we had to let go of everybody at Booyah. It was just me and one other guy, Josh Carview, bless his heart. I'm not getting paid. He's getting paid barely anything. And just over a couple of years, we built that thing back up, got business going. And as we started getting into it and, and got, you know, more and more people back on 20, 30, we're like, okay, we're not going to win the search game. Like, Google is so just, it's going to dominate. You don't, I this don't, relates to your point. If you're taking on an incumbent, you better kill the king or queen. Otherwise it ain't going to work. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, you know, really, um, you know, the official start date of SpotX is 2007, but really it started earlier than that. Right. And in 2005, um, I said, okay, um, we started this agency. We converted Booyah into a, a search engine marketing agency. We're really lucky to find some folks from, uh, who were in Denver uh, from Avenue A, Razorfish, uh, you know, by a guy by the name of Troy Lerner. He started building this agency in the search space, and then it became a full service uh, agency. And it's around today, Booyah Advertising. Um, and so he ran with that. I said, okay, we've got some cool technology here. I love this auction based technology, but we got to be so far ahead in another industry that, you know, like Google's not looking at it and no one else is there. And so I looked at two things and I started doing research. I went to all these conferences. One was local, you know, search, which is, you know, services, the small, medium, uh, you know, size businesses, yellow pages type customers. If people remember yellow pages and yep. then, um, and then video. And, you know, I was looking at, I'm like, Oh God, this is a tiny space, but the way people were, delivering video ads, they would, they would go to ESPN or NBC and say, uh, I'm PNG. I want to sponsor these videos. And they go, okay. And they would take the video and they take the ad and they connect them, make it one video file. And then they would give the advertiser a, a, a an Excel spree, spreadsheet at the end of the day and say, Hey, um, we served a million ads. Like, okay, I don't know. And, you know, I'm trusting that this Excel spreadsheet is correct. So I was like, Hey, we can take this technology and uh, this auction-based technology and dyna dynamically serve ads in real time against these videos as they are clicked on. And um, I mean, we, that's what we invented. And literally I spent, I remember being so inspired by this idea. I spent like two or three days in my house and I sketched the whole system out. My parents came and visited. They probably don't even remember this. The house is covered with paper and it's like, and I, and it's all the sketches. And then back to my point, I went to Alan, who was working with, with us by this time. Uh, he was uh, helping with Booyah on this. He built this, the, the search platform uh, or actually took over for the, the, the first engineers that actually built it uh, in 2001. And uh, I'm like, Alan, can you build this? He's like, yep, I can do it. And, you know, we started building the team and build that. I mean, it was a dreadful three years, by the way. You know? So I'm going to ask you a couple things about that period. Let's start with those couple days in which you can see it and you're, you're, uh, I've got this just whirlwind of activity and putting things up on the walls and, and around the house. Um, there's a story about Brian Wilson from the Beach Boys that um, goes like this. When, when he was writing Pet Sounds, the album, which is a great, great album as far as I'm concerned. A lot of other people think so too. Um, uh, one of Brian Wilson's, uh, his wife's friends came over and she opened the door and he had put sand all over the living room floor. 
And it was just clear sand in his piano. And, and the wife's friend said, this is pretty weird. <laughs> he said, yes, but he is writing such beautiful songs. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Was, was this like sure. your Brian Wilson moment? Was it, was it like that? I'm not sure anybody backed me up saying he said he's writing such beautiful business <laughs> plan. <laughs> or, or, was it like just a, sketches. but it was a, it was an explosion of thinking. Yeah. And I mean, listen, that is what it's all about. Like, like when you can invent something and it, you're literally making up something and then you convert it to zeros and ones. I remember we, we did this, we launched it. And then I, I met with, I won't mention his name, but he was the king of advertising on the, on the buy side. And one of my sales guys said, I know him. I'll get us in. I mean, he's, he's like, he's, he owned TV advertising for 50 years on an agency side. Very well-known guy. And I went and I pitched him and I showed him the platform and he goes, this will never work. And that was just crushing. And so I saw him about, you know, 10 years later, I'm like, Hey, do you remember that meeting? He goes, no. And I go, well, this is what happened. He goes, yeah, I was wrong a lot, but he's like, good for you. Right. You know? And, and so, yeah, it, but it's such a neat feeling. That's, that's the drive to be able to invent something, make it up. And, and have people actually pay you for that is incredible. As you look back at the inspiration, were there things that were like this that you drew on? Where, where did it come from? The idea of I, dynamically auctioning the ads. Yeah, I just think from the search space. I think uh -huh. I really just think like I, I really love this idea that when someone clicks, like so first off, you would an advertiser would go in and buy a keyword and says, I will pay 75 cents every time someone searches this and clicks on it. I'm like, that is, that's beautiful. Uh, and then, so to be able to convert that into video, I think, you know, search was the inspiration, but I, no, I don't, I don't really think anything else it could have been, um, but I, I don't think anything else really w was out there that inspired right. me to do that. I'm going to float one of my, my quasi theories by you and see what you think. One version of entrepreneurship, one version is um, someone who can see steps one, two, three, six, ten, hmm. and just trust that he, she, they can figure the rest out. Is that what you were doing there? Yeah, I mean, that's, I have my own theory. I don't know if it's the same or not, uh, that you just get so excited <laughs> that uh, you block all of other like, nah, this is not gonna, you know, work. And sure, there's this issue. You're just like, no, we'll we'll make it happen, right? That just sheer like almost naivete. Like if I knew what I had to do to get here today, I definitely wouldn't have done it. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's talk a little bit about team and and you've. Uh, you know, I love that you have said, hey, look, there's a lot of people uh, in addition to me that, that built this company and made it a success. And you've talked about Steve. Um, Alan, in terms of the technology, you know, from a, from a lay person's perspective, is there something here we like to make this thing work when the smartest people in the business were telling us what wouldn't work? Here was Alan's leap or Alan's team's leap that really broke through. Was there, was there something along the way that Alan did? You know what? He just left it all on the field and he convinced uh, a lot of great people. And I think that's really at the end of the day, like I tell everybody, you're a salesman. You know, I don't care what position you play, you're a salesman. And so, you know, for Alan uh, to be able to, you know, hire people and to, to really kind of uh, lead the charge, right. Put it out on the field and have his, his people do that. And, and of course, you know, We've lost people over the years. We've got people that I've been working with 20, 25 years at the same time. Uh, but, you know, I just think like Alan, uh, you know, can do the same thing. And really any advice, you know, that, you know, the other advice I always give to entrepreneurs is, is about that team and, and especially the starting team. Like, I think I've only read, this is going to be awful one business book <laughs> and, and, and it was, you know, Boulder based Jim Collins. Uh, and you know, his, his, his message about getting the right people on the bus, you know? And, and so, you know, I, I look at like Alan and Steve and myself as, you know, kind of the, 
the the first three people on that really kind of were the you know the stool right the you know the all three sides of the stool and the legs of the stool and then um and then it was the trick was really okay then how do you then it's the next level right um and and how do you get that next level of people on sorry there's a helicopter going over hope you don't hear that your audio is coming through fine all good um and so how do you, it's like that next step of getting that next layer because you can't interview everybody after that, right? And so um, I, you know, I, I could go on for hours about culture, motivation, you know, getting people to, to believe and really kind of follow through and also elimination of politics, all of that, like that, those, all those elements deserve a lot of discussion to be quite honest. <laughs> Well, let, let's drill down on a couple of them. Is there something in terms of, you know, culture that you feel like looking back, we got this right early and here's how it paid off for us? Yes, um, I do. And I think it was um, an absolute like team effort. Um, you know, sure, it gets, you know, the stage is set by Alan, myself, Steve, um, but then it's an expectation that everybody uh, you know, carries the mantle in terms of maintaining a good culture. One of the things we spent a lot of time on um, and, and, and every, you know, CEO, especially when you, you, you go from 50 people to 100 people to, you know, we're over 400 people. And now we join Magnite with 1,000 people. There's no, there's no room for politics, empire building, silos, um, you know, you, you need to all work together. You need to be, you know, really transparent and honest with each other. Uh, you know, if, if anyone was playing politics and empire building, didn't go with us, you're out, right? We spent a lot of effort on that. And I think that helped build this culture that um, I think is world-class. I mean, everybody, you know, really believe, you know, in kind of the mission and the vision, and that's another thing. You know, as, 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 you're, as you get bigger, right, you know, 50 people to 100 people to, to 400 people, like, how do you get everybody, like, focused and believing? And uh, I learned a lot from the people I work with, and ultimately, they kind of helped even me focus to say, hey, listen, if we're gonna get 400 people here, like, all rowing in the same direction, we gotta set that vision, we gotta set that mission for the year, and, and would you, we, would you we have did, a different mission and, and vision each year or would it be uh, yeah. it over the years? Yeah. So our vision that was that long term, like this is what we're all about. Right. And, um, you know, it's funny because we, we actually came up with that pretty late in the game, but it was basically what we had been doing all the time. You know, it's dynamic auction on, platform for video or it was basically it providing the, you know, uh, world class, you know, platform you know, video platform and team, right? So we're known for our customer service. Even though it's a tech world, we're known for our customer service and our client service. You know, uh, we're very consultative. We're, we're gonna provide the best in video advertising, the best video platform in the world. That's the vision. Very simple, straightforward. We're not, and by the way, as an entrepreneur, whew, you can, you, all sorts of pressure. Hey, we need to do display. Hey, we need to do mobile. Nope, we're just doing video. That was tough in itself. So I think getting, setting that and getting everybody focused on that year in, year out. And then yes, the mission, you know, that probably changes every two, three years, you know, just you're tweaking it because you're growing, you're evolving, you got to evolve. You know, CTV for us, the connected TV, four years ago, didn't have any of it. Today, it's 75% of our business, oh. right? So at least, so, um, you, you know, you have to obviously always reinvent yourself to be honest. So two more questions, then I'm going to open it up to um, questions from, from those who are participating uh, in the audience. So I'm going to invite everyone to drop questions in the Q&A. Um, one is, when did you have some sense that, hey, this is validation, this thing's starting to sing? Or, or was there a moment in which you're like, ah, smart, smart people were telling me we couldn't do it. We're doing it. Yeah. Yeah. So early on, like I said, the first three years were really tough. You know, you know, they don't call it bleeding edge for nothing, right? Mm -hmm. So if you're going to invent something, you better, you know, you know, be sure you want to persevere and, and go through this. Um, 
So when we launched, yeah, I, I had all, I had the supply side figured out. I had a lot of customers on the supply side who would give us video inventory, real time calls, no buyers. And the buyers, the advertisers are notoriously slow and also notoriously like, I'm not going to be first. And so uh, I remember we got this client, he was spending $30,000 a month. We're like, oh my God, we're actually making money from this a thousand dollars a day. The system's starting to work. And after like two months of that client, and then we found out it was a, a pyramid scheme and they weren't going to pay us. And we had to, <laughs> yeah, we had to pay everybody on the supply side, oh. but we had to eat it on the buy side. So it was another, uh, and by the way, Booyah was profitable. So they continued to fund it. So that's how we were able to do all this of uh, $13 million. Um, and so, but it was our first real client was this, it's a phar pharmaceutical company. Uh, uh, it's called Reckett Benkiser. They, you know, OTC, you know, they, um, Mucinex is one of their, uh, you know, uh, brands. And they just totally bought into it. And they started spending a million dollars a month with us and then $2 million a month. And so that was, that got real exciting. That was like, oh my God, this, there is something. It was still a long road ahead. But that, that to me was the moment where I, oh my God, we may make this. <laughs> One more question. And, I, and we can get into this more, I think, with the audience as well. But um, so you guys uh, sold um, for $400 million a couple of years ago. And then um, there's the, the billion, dollar, <laughs> billion dollar sale um, <laughs> this spring. Talk about that decision. Um, a couple of years ago to, to go ahead and sell for, for 400 million? Was it hard? Did it feel like a no brainer? Uh, just walk us through that. Yeah. I mean, so it was actually the first, uh, it was uh, RTL bought us um, and they, they bought a portion of our company and it was, uh, uh, you know, 65% in 2014 and then the remainder in 2017. Okay. Yep. Uh, and that last round, that last one was at 400 million. So blended, it was about 300 million. You know, I think that um, what drove that, right? So first off, you know, we had we we created a a, a very nice company. It, it nothing to do with like CTV, by the way. Online video, we were scaling nicely, and um, we got a bid. And they come in and they say, "Hey, we want to you know buy you." The 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 nice thing is like the first bid, and we had two bidders. The first one was for a hundred million, and we're like, "Yeah, no, thank you." So by, by the end of that process, we got it to, you know, quarter billion dollars. So, okay, bravo, sell, sell 65%. You know, I think, um, listen, I, of course, look back and say, oh, if I just hung on, I got to sold it for a billion. Although I don't know if I'd be alive. I honestly, it takes so much out of you and so much pressure that to be able to sell at a, obviously respectable quarter billion dollars and then $400 million. Uh, and, and to honestly, personally be richer than I ever thought I'd ever be right. It was just a win, but also all those investors, all those people who work for us, it changed all these people's lives. Right. So I'm so proud of that. So I don't regret that. Um, and then, I mean, how rare is it for the company that buys us, to be able to, we have first off the exec stay, and then we actually improve on the business. We completely reinvent it for re, uh, CTV, and then we get validated in 2021 with you know a 1.1 billion dollar purchase. Like <laughs> that to me, I'm really happy for RTL. I'm happy for everybody in the line, and I hope Magnite makes money off us too and sees a return. Yeah. Um, well. Uh... Let's open up the questions and I'll again encourage all those that would like to drop a question in the Q&A. And Gabe is a student here at CU. Gabe, I think we're going to elevate you and put you on point for, uh, for leading the questions. Gabe, thanks for joining. Gabe, what do we got? Lob one in. Hi, uh, thank you for your time today, uh, Mr. Sheehan. It's been great hearing about your story. And uh, one thing that really impressed me from you know, what you just mentioned was that you were really able to uh, kind of reorient the entire company based on new technologies, providing different sources of revenue. And I was wondering how you were able to kind of uh, 
change based on the technology in such a short amount of time. So like with connected uh, TV becoming 75% of the revenue in the past couple of years, I, I imagine new technologies, maybe like connected devices or wearables, things that might tell you more about the actual end users seeing the customers. Like how are you actually able to just change on a dime like that? And do you see different technologies being that new change in the future? Yeah, I mean, oh God, great questions. Listen, I think it's all encompassing. It's not only like changing your product roadmap uh, and convincing everybody, by the way, we're gonna do this. Uh, you know, and by the way, we can't pay attention to this original uh, business that we have here. Um, you know, uh, and, and, and not only that, we had to fire about 100 clients. So our revenues took a serious dive. Um, and so that was obviously very tough for our people because they were firing clients and, and, you know, of course, relationships, personal relationships. And we were saying, you know what, we don't want to work with you anymore. We need to focus over here. Um, RTL was not very happy either. Um, they had just bought us for, you know, the $400 million and I tanked the revenues. Uh, and, and, but the, the deal was this, um, you know, we on with online video, we sold a lot of, let's, I'm using an example, a lot of CNN inventory for $5. But the, the people who are selling it were intermediaries to CNN. What we were saying in CTV is saying, hey, you know what? We're going to fire those intermediaries. We're going to actually go work directly with CNN. And we're going to sell their TV advertising. So instead of for five, we're going to sell it for $25 CPM. That's per thousand ads. And, um, and so that caused even, it was, it was actually one of the worst years of my life, <laughs> 2017, 18. Uh, but, you know, thank God in 19 and 20, it really started to take, take off. And today I can say almost 100% of the major media owners out there it, in CTV use our platform, right? So it worked, thank God. <laughs> but it was hard, really hard. Gabe, I'll take the next question. Then maybe you can jump in on, on Nassar's question. Um, Fiona Boger uh, has this question, Mike, and I think that sounds like you've worked with her a little bit. She was the shareholder rep on the uh, SpotX RTL transaction back in the day. <laughs> she has a great question here, which is, you know, if the technology was not your area of deep expertise, that you are not coming um, from this from a deep technologist perspective, um, how did you make hiring decisions about the CTO and know whether, uh, in this case, um, uh, Alan had the right technology chops to uh, to get the job done. You know, it's it's um, it's you know one great thing about my relationship with Alan and Steve uh, is we can literally say anything to each other, and we can give complete, one hundred percent honest feedback. And a lot of times it's not great feedback, right? But we can, we can talk that way to each other and, and just take ego out of it. And my dad actually always comments on this. He's like, you guys have literally like, you know, when you get this big and you got like, you know, people are becoming powerful and like their ego usually gets into the, into the way. And so I don't know how, but you know, um, a little more on Alan, <laughs> we hired Alan myself. Uh, and my first business partner, Andy Stern, back in DC, and we started this e-commerce company, Logics. And um, and <laughs> at, we worked in a barn, a legitimate barn in Maryland. And um, Alan responded to a help wanted CTO ad <laughs> in in the paper, the Washington Post, and it literally said CTO wanted fax number, and we got his. <laughs> And he came out and he's got a great job with CyberCash, which was the first payment gateway. And he drives out there and he, and he tells the story and he's like, where am I and what am I doing here? And uh, you know what? We interviewed him. He actually ended up fixing our DSL line right, right there and then. I'm like, this is our guy. <laughs> but, you know, it's, it's just trust. It's been built over time. He built, he built logics with us. Um, th this next question comes from a, uh, a student, a uh, graduate student who's building his own company. Um, and it's a good question, which is founder at really pre-seed stage, 
How do you get out of the looping problem of trying to provide traction for investors so that they come in, but struggling to get some traction, especially proof points, without money in the door in the first instance, especially from the vantage point of a, a graduate student who's not yet bankable in the eyes of, of many investors? Yeah, no, that's a good question. I definitely can relate, you know, having the lack of resources and money. Um, and I would say that, um, listen, if you can really get buy-in from other people, meaning can you get people to join your team uh, at, that, you know, really believe in the vision that, you know, give it their all in their spare time or what have you. Um, and then that will just help you kind of, you know, make, you know, hopefully achievable, you know, uh, uh, goals uh, at progress. It, it's like, I just know you, you can't do this on your own. I don't know of a CEO who has everything, right? And, and you know, so the technical chops, the financial chops, the strategic chops, the, you know, the sales chops, it just, it doesn't exist. Um, and so I think like, you know, I think one of the best things and the best thing that ever happened to me is just being able to find partners early before even the business started. Um, a friend likes to, Jason Mendelson likes to say the most important first sale you have is those co-founders to bring totally. them. And from there, yeah, you've got others. Uh, uh, we've got a former startup summer student, uh, Andrew, who's going to jump in. Andrew, uh, let's promote him and fire away. Andrew, good to see you, man. Hey, good to see you, Brad. And thank you, Mike, for being here. I'm, I'm wondering about your experience after the dot-com boom, when you lost six million and, and you really took that hit hard. Did it, did it temper the way you looked at prospective business ideas? And like, was there a moment where you had to really convince yourself that an internet company was something that you really authentically wanted to pursue and keep pursuing after, after the dot-com bubble burst? Yeah, I, that's a great question. I think, listen, I think, you know, every story we've, we've talked about today or every stage you know, I've always kind of walked away with something that I've been able to apply, you know, uh, going forward. And I'm still like school is still in session for me. You know, there's never the end to the to the learning here. I mean, you know what I came away from. I mean, I got a lot of lessons out of the dot com bubble. Um, one of which is like, is it too good to be true? It probably is. You know, this this I'm not I did not invest in Dogecoin. Uh, I, <laughs> you know, so I don't know. I don't, I, I, I that's, that's gotta be a bubble. Um, but Hey, I might be wrong. You never know. That's what makes all this stuff beautiful. But, um, you know, I just, I'm very cautious, you know, for me, I learned like, uh, and I'm probably a horrible investor, by the way. Um, I did like, I am part of this uh, venture group called ardent, uh, VC. It's how Brad and I got connected here. Um, there's partners and those partners are, legitimate investors and then there's ceo partners the guys with the operational uh, experience like david wright's part of it right he, he started and sold solid fire he's such a smart guy he's he's a ceo partner along with me i'd be a terrible just standalone investor because i, I mean i will invest money where um there's high risk and i'm involved 100 percent or 150 percent. other than that i should probably be very conservative with my investment strategy <laughs> Andrew, thank you for the question. Appreciate you jumping in. Um, Scott Martinez has a great question. He says, uh, Mike, love hearing the stories of how you started. Uh, I'm on with my 14-year-old son. We're curious, how'd you pick up the business basics? Everything from understanding profit loss and business plans when your background was in uh, what would appear to be a completely different area. Yeah, great question. Um, and it's just experience. That's why I say like, just go do stuff. Uh, you know, it probably started uh, when I was 14 and my dad had me mowing lawns and, you know, I was making that money uh, and knew, you know, okay, I got to spend my time here to get that money. Um, thankfully, my dad, you know, bought the uh, lawnmower, so I didn't have to deal with the OPEX side. Um, and then, you know, I think it's just, again, just, you know, the experience, um, of, you know, starting these businesses, you know, of course, I look back at my first job at a startup, uh, which I was the fourth person there. I was the secretary and I was head of sales by the end of the year, uh, you know, it, and, and just learning that and getting involved in a startup. It didn't matter how much I made. I mean, 
yeah, I made 30 grand that year. That's what I was getting paid. But what I actually learned there was how to start a business. What are like the, like, what makes a good leader? What makes a bad leader? What makes a good team? What makes a dysfunctional team? I saw a lot of dysfunction. Uh, and then, you know, through that, you know, I hired my buddy from school and, and he's like, we got to go start a company. I'm like, no, dude, we can't do that. No, 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 no. And he convinced me and we started Logix. And again, the company that bought us, they were like, do you guys do your own accounting? And we're like, uh-huh. And they're like, yeah, it shows you guys are terrible. <laughs> <laughs> QuickBooks. Uh, and so it's just learning and you got to experience it. I mean, you certainly learning it. I didn't, you know, take any of those classes in school, but it was, you know, the school of hard knocks, I think. And, you know, there's just nothing beats that. Uh, Ron has a good question, which is, uh, what was life like working for a large entity like RTL and how did that uh, change the culture? How did you adapt the culture um, as the larger uh, owner came in? It was really tough. Uh, not only was it larger, um, it was a European company. Uh, and uh, you know what, I, you know, I'm very thankful to those folks. Um, they're really smart, um, you know, I, but I, they went through a lot of change over the last three years and we kind of were dragged along with that change. You know, they had big vision for us. Okay, let's go achieve this big vision. Hey, you pay me a lot of money, uh, I'm there for you. You know what, and always had a good attitude. Um, but you know what, then I got a new boss and then they changed their overall strategy. Then I got a new boss and it, it was very frustrating. So I can't say I wasn't like, incredibly frustrated with them as well. Um, the one thing that happened or didn't happen that I'm really thankful for is they never really integrated us. Uh, they just allowed us to operate uh, as spot X. We didn't call it become RTL X. And we opened some divisions in Europe and you know some joint ventures. That was a little frustrating, but also we had a lot of success. So I learned a lot, um, but you know, Steve and I really took it upon ourselves to go, you know what? Let's block them at the door. You know, they don't want to integrate us. Let's service them, be the best partner possible. But from a culture standpoint, we're spot X and let's, let's take the hits here. And so that's how we were able to kind of sell and actually have a better version of our company, even after all of that kind of the morass of trying to, you know, be a good partner with RTL. Um, question about keeping team together. You, you've talked about building team. But I'm thinking about, you know, Alan, for example, his skill set in, you know, creating a, a technology platform that's processing, you know, millions of decision points in fractions of a second. Well, that would have been pretty helpful for high frequency trading, right? I mean, there's all sorts mm -hmm. of things I'm sure people are recruiting Alan for, and I'm sure you could go down the line of other team members. A any reflections on here's how we keep people together once we have them, whether it's you know, formal incentive programs, like I'm a big believer in this, or mm -hmm. it's more informal and, and tacit type programs? Well, I think it's, uh, of course, like multifaceted. Um, I would, uh, let, let's stick with the executive team, you know, um, with, with regards to this conversation. Um, I, I think it's kind of a combination of just so many different things. At the end of the day, though, it's like, it's a personal relationship. And um, I think it starts with, listen, you all are in battle together, right? That's the enemy. We're in battle. And to, um, they all know I got their back 100% and vice versa. So I, I think it, it starts there. So that complete trust, uh, you know, that, that uh, emp empowerment, I'm, you know, I, I give a lot of autonomy to, to folks. Um, I certainly will step in when they need me to. Uh, I think that's how we've been able to scale, or at least I've learned to be able to, you know, scale with the company and still be an effective leader. Um, and then, of course, you know, and I, I think a lot of companies miss this, just incent them the right way. Like it's, you know, okay, yes, we're all friends here. We're in battle together. We're looking out for each other. And at the end of the day, what does this mean for me? You know, I, I've got a family at home. I've got, you know, like I need to be paid. And so, um, I think the equity component of anything, like certainly you pay, you know, your base and you're, you, you create a, a proper uh, short-term incentive plan from a cash perspective bonus, uh, but it's that equity. 
right? Um, but what is really incredible is that we kept that same team after selling to RTL and they had no real equity program. Uh, and so I, I, you know, so I don't know, ask my people what the secret sauce there, why did they stay? Except I guess the one other thing I would say is like, you better be sure back to my mission and vision, like, hey, what's the vision? Do you all believe in this? And then if you believe in it, I think that's a big part of it. Like we're all going this direction because people want to achieve things and achieve great things. So I think that's, that's part of it as well. But it's like, you know, it's like not one thing. It's so many different things. Uh, we've got one more question before um, we close, Mike. And it comes from Bryce who says, culture preservation seems to be uh, one reason external investors and partners, including uh, RTL, really respected your autonomy to, to lead the company. What skills did you have or not have? And what external resources did you, did you utilize to maintain that culture even as the company grew? Well, um, it's a good question. I would say it's a recognition of all the skills I know I lack <laughs> and complete dependence on all these people. Um, I don't know. I, I, I think, uh, and I'm actually pretty serious about that. You know, uh, you know, Steve does what he does and he's the best. Alan does what he does. He does, you know, and just on down the line. Um, and then just having that trust, you know, we never really. Hey, can I ask a question about that, Mike, though, because um, it's clear that you have admiration and respect for the people that have helped you build, uh, that have built this alongside you. Um, but that's an interesting piece to have respect for them but still to challenge each other. You talked about the ability to have very honest, hard conversations with one another. And so maybe you could, I, I'd be interested in how do those two balance out, which is, hey, Alan's a better technologist than me, but I still need to have a hard conversation. How, how do you manage that respect without being overly deferential? Uh, I think it's, it's, a, it's a skill, to be, to be quite honest, to be able to um, have that conversation to say, you know, in a way that, listen, I, I still have your back. I'm just telling you something you might not really recognize. And uh, I'm telling you this from the standpoint of we'll be a better company and you'll be a better, you know, manager or technologist or, you know, and, and I think you got to come at it from uh, an empathetic, you know, point of view going, hey, listen, I know your position, right? And I know your challenges, but I'm, I'm, I'm just doing this, you know, self-servingly so we built, we built a better company but actually at the end of the day like if we can have this honest conversation you should be able to walk away from it not threatened and that's a real thing like if people feel threatened end of conversation uh you know it's not going to work it's not going to ring true right so if you can say it in a way i think that is like listen i'm telling you this is the deal i'm giving you heads up right and we got to fix this i'll help you I think that's, that's, uh, it's a big part of it. I, you know, and some people have that skill and some people don't. Um, Mike, this has been um, such a treat. I am, and on behalf of everyone, um, this has been a ton of fun. Thank you for taking time out to, to share the story. Uh, looking forward to where you, you and the team take this next. Yeah, no, this was fun. I really appreciate it. I love telling our story. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, on behalf of uh, all of us at Silicon Flatirons, thanks to all of you for, for tuning in. Um, and uh, as I mentioned, if, you're inter if you've got an internship program, we're ramping up for Startup Summer. Reach out to me. Uh, thanks to all the Silicon Flatirons team. Have a good night.